Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I could ask you to take your seats, please. We'd like to get the show on the road. Well, again, good morning and uh, welcome to AI Bio's sixth annual Impact Innovations event. My name is Steve Price. I'm currently the interim CEO for Alberta Innovates Biosolutions. And it's a pleasure for me to be here today to see such a large audience. Now, I realize it's early in the morning and a lot of people don't function that well in the morning. And you don't respond well to questions if you're like me. But I'm gonna ask a question anyways. I'm gonna ask by show of hand, how many people are here at their first Impact Innovations event? I think it's about 51 uh, percent of you. 50, 50, 50 to 51 percent. Actually, we know that there are 361 individuals that registered to be here today. Um, and, uh, and you know what? They made a wise decision. Normally, this event is held in Ziedler Hall downstairs. But this year, Impact Innovation has been so popular that we were running the risk of having to have overflow video in the, uh, in the uh, reception hall outside of the Ziedler Theater. So, thankfully, the Citadel Theater uh, demonstrated significant flexibility and made this much larger Schachter Theatre available to us. So thank you very much, Citadel Theatre, for catering to us at AI Bio. I'd like to do something else right at the moment. I attend a lot of these functions, and you know what? I hardly ever meet many people. So what I'd like you to do right now is introduce yourself to the person sitting immediately in front of you, immediately to your left, to your right and behind you. And I'm gonna go over here, out of the lights, to watch. Now, don't you feel better? You know somebody here. But I'm shocked. I'm absolutely shocked. Because I know that one of the young AI bio staff people are sitting here with their spouse of about eight months. And when I was looking, she didn't even introduce herself to her spouse. I think that's terrible. I think, why don't you stand up and give Brock a good big hug? Come on. Come on. Oh, Brock, that was a perfect opportunity for you to take advantage. So it's been an extremely busy year at AI Bio. Uh, we've had numerous calls for proposals, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen calls for the food innovation uh, business line, the bio-industrial innovation business line, the biological GH, uh, GHG management program. We saw renewal for the Prion Research Institute for another five years. We renewed our agreement with CCEMC on delivery of the biological GHG management program. We saw the launch of three new bioindustrial programs. It has been a good year at AI Bio. And I'm absolutely certain that many of you are part of the reason that it's been a good year. Through your willingness to cooperate with us, to partner with us, to collaborate, to develop research proposals for our considerations, your interest in searching and researching biosolutions has made it 
a great year for AI Bio, and I want to say thank you for working with us. I'd also like to extend sincere thanks to the staff of AI Bio, who over the course of the last year have worked extremely hard, diligently, uh, to ensure that the programs that we deliver meet your expectations and address the priorities of the province of Alberta. This morning, you're going to hear from six presenters, six researchers that have worked with Biosolutions over the past several years. But before we get to those six researchers, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask Pam Valentine to come to the stage. Pam is an academic, a researcher, She's a research manager with, uh, with Alberta Innovates Health Solutions. Uh, she's the interim CEO of Alberta Innovates Health Solutions and currently serves as the transition CEO of the new Alberta Innovates Corporation. Pam, the podium is yours. Thanks, Steve. It's a great delight to be here today as the Alberta Innovates Transition CEO. And on behalf of our chair, Judy Fairburn, and our board of directors of Alberta Innovates, welcome and thank you for joining us today. We're entering a new era for research and innovation in our province. We're consolidating four Innovates corporations into a single integrated agency that encompasses our key sectors of food, fiber, energy, environment, and health. Why are we doing this and why now? Because we've recognized that when we talk about Alberta's key sectors, the challenges that we faced often impact across those sectors. We need an innovation system that is able to address these cross-sectoral issues effectively. For example, today you'll hear from Dr. Sillins, who will be talking about wildfires and their impact on downstream water quality. So we need to think about environment and fiber, and clearly there's a connection to be made to health. In today's world, we need to compete at the global level to build on the strengths of our province's research and innovation activities, because innovation is a global game. That means that we have to have a sharper, more responsive support for research and innovations to be able to accelerate promising advances to success at the global level. All the researchers and innovators in this room know that collaborations and partnerships at many levels are key to your work. Through Alberta Innovates, we will be able to offer one-door access to supports, expert advice, and services across all our core sectors to help strengthen our competitiveness provincially and move innovations into application and commercialization faster. The diversification of our economy and the resulting economic stability depends on innovative approaches put into action now, not just in research and innovation, but in all areas of society. We have a treasure in Alberta, and that treasure is our broad and robust research and innovation ecosystem. Thousands of people are involved at all points in the research an innovation activity, and their successes are many. In the realm of Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, we have successes along the continuum of research and innovation and application, from basic research into the causes of prion diseases, to the development of bioactive films from potato waste for food packaging, to economic policy development for environmental goods and services. The thousands of people working at all stages and all points along the continuum of research to impact, all these people are contributing to the economic, social, and health improvement for us and our children. Our job at Alberta Innovates is to streamline, support, and accelerate great ideas into global impacts for Alberta. That's the Alberta, Alberta Innovates promise. Being at today's Impact Innovation event is a privilege. I know from past years, not only will we learn, but we'll be entertained. A tall order and one I know that our six featured researchers will deliver. 
I'm delighted to be here today and to learn with you about the great work in food, forestry, agriculture, research and innovation. I'm excited about the bold new step we as a province are taking in building our tremendous research and innovation power. I invite you to check out our main albertainnovates.ca website for news and updates. It's now my great pleasure to hand the podium over to well-known science writer and broadcaster, Mr. Jay Ingram, who will serve as our MC for the rest of the program. Jay? So far, you said, uh, turn off your cell phones. Mine just rang. So I guess it's my job to say, please turn off your uh, cell phones. Uh, so this happened once already. So we'll just, uh, let me just do it from here. Please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> How, what a rude awakening that was for me just now. So it's difficult, isn't it? Uh, Fort McMurray is on all our minds. And really, if you look at the decline in oil prices and even go back to 2013 and the flood in Calgary, of which I had a first-hand look. It's been a rough uh, couple of years, but as we've already seen in the response, actually internationally, to Fort McMurray, there's a lot of resilience, especially here in this province. And I think uh, something that's really often overlooked is that uh, while the rest of Canada and maybe especially downtown Toronto, thinks that, and I can say that because I used to live there, uh, think that we are an oil and gas province and nothing else. The fact is that a substantial part of the economy here is food, agriculture, and forestry. And what you're going to see today is a beautiful example, ranging over six different topics, as Pamela said, uh, of just how fast-moving and forward-looking and international in scope uh, food, agri uh, food, agriculture, and forestry research is in this province. And when I say international, I mean not just the impact internationally, but the fact that this province, we can attract researchers from all over the world. So just to go back to Fort McMurray for one second, uh, obviously the immediate concern is re-establishing people and businesses there. Uh, I'm sure you've already heard lots of comments around climate change and what uh, meaning that might have for this and other wildfires. But the research you're about to hear about takes a slightly different angle and I think a really intriguing one, and that is looking at the long-range impacts of wildfires, not just long-range in terms of time, but in terms of area. Olda Sillens is a professor of renewable resources at the Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environmental Sciences at the U of A, which from now on I'm calling ALES. And he's been looking at the connection, as Pamela indicated, between wildfires and water qualities. Olda. Thank you so much uh, for that, that introduction, and, and thank you so much to Alberta Innovates for, uh, for inviting me to come and talk about our work. It's such an auspicious occasion. Um, thanks to, uh, to Pam and Jay for both uh, mentioning, oh, I'm not going to talk about plant, I could talk about plant breeding. It, w it wouldn't be that interesting. Um, <laughs> I'd do my best. Um, so is there a possibility of, there we go. That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so thanks to, uh, to Pam and Jay for, uh, for reminding us uh, about Fort McMurray and, and the attention that uh, Fort McMurray has brought uh, provincially, uh, nationally, internationally. We're all very concerned about, about how things are developing in Fort McMurray. So today, really, I'm going to talk about, as Jay indicated, I'm going to talk about uh, forests and some of the pressures we're seeing in those forests. I'm going to, I'm going to tie this back to, uh, to wildfire in Fort McMurray, but really thinking about how do those forests provide other resources that we're, that we're particularly concerned about. Water is going to be the principal focus of this. We have a large team that's been working on really linking what's going on with forests in this province and how is that connected to the state and condition of our water supplies and ecological goods and services uh, that flow from water that we're all concerned about. 
Um, and so really the focus here then in terms of, of the province is we've been thinking about this for quite a long time with the, the Provincial Water Act, the Water for Life strategy, most recently the renewed uh, water conversation and our, and our action plan. So how do we manage, how do we think about um, our source waters and their connections downstream to, um, to the water values that we're particularly concerned about? Um, so, thinking about forests and water, many of you may um, be unaware of this. Uh, if we think about the province of Alberta and where the water actually comes from, this is a map of unit area runoff. So basically this just shows the distribution of where the water is produced in the province. And you can see that, that water production runoff is not uniform across the province. Uh, we have some areas that, that produce a lot of water and some areas that don't produce much water at all. So if we look at how that's connected to the different land bases that we have. Um, this, this upper map here just shows the, uh, the, the green zone, the forested green area of the province. Uh, the white zone, mostly agricultural lands, um, mountain parks. Um, and you can see that the lion's share of the water uh, on which we depend and our economy uh, and society depend really originates from the forested regions of the province. So for example, uh, in some allied work we've done around connecting water resources from forests to water supplies, um, we've been able to calculate that um, uh, two out of three uh, Albertans, 2.4 million Albertans are dependent on water that originates from forested land base for their, their critical drinking water needs. So um, there's a real close connection between, between those forests and the water supply uh, that, we're, that we're concerned about. Um, and so that brings us then thinking about climate change. We've seen over the past decade, two decades, uh, some of the early signs of, of shifting climates, of climate change on the, the state and condition, the health of those forested landscapes, not just here in Alberta, but all over North America and indeed all over the world. Uh, one of, you know, we can think about uh, how that's tied into increasing infest, insect infestation, disease, mountain pine beetle, a really great example, and wildfire. The increasing occurrence, severity, size of some of these large wildfires. Um, in the American, uh, in the conterminous United States, uh, south of the 49th parallel, they've seen a three-fold increase in total area burn just over the last three decades. And that really is connected to, uh, to shifting climates and, and fire behavior driven by, driven by weather. We've seen the same kind of things here in Alberta. So I, I was cautioned against showing too many graphs, but I'm going to do that anyway, thinking about our fire situation. Here we're looking at Alberta fire occurrence over five decades. We get about 1,500 on average fires per year, some years worse than other years. And what you're looking at here is the distribution of fire sizes across five decades. And what you see for these smallest fires, so the, those lines increasingly look at larger and larger fires. So the bottom line, kind of maybe one hectare size fires through increasingly large fires up to maybe 100 or 300 hectares or so. And what you can see is that fire sizes have been going down. Um, and that's because we are throwing more resources at those. Um, we have a lot more technology to fight these fires, but as we look at the largest fires, what you can see for those big fires, they've also been going down except for the last decade, decade and a half. That situation has changed. So these fires are becoming extremely large. Um, and you've been hearing about that a lot over the last 10 days, two weeks. These fires get so large that effectively there's not much you can do with them other than get out of the way. So this idea of climate feedback on wildfires is something that's, that's also found its way into even the public vernacular. So this idea of megafires um, driven by climate really is something that we're becoming increasingly concerned about all over the world. Um, in Alberta, uh, we had a whole series of fires and, and our research team started working on one of these fires in the extreme southwest corner of the province. We started looking at these fires and how do they affect water resources? So, uh, what we have in, the, in that southwest corner, uh, a large group of catchments, fully instrumented. We have about 45, 50 distributed uh, climate stations, hydrometric groundwater monitoring stations. So it's been an intense research effort to try and figure out, well, how does fire affect water resources? That's what's happening in the headwaters. 
So we've also looking at, well, what does that mean downstream? So how do those effects propagate at, a, at increasingly larger basin scales? So looking at the headwaters of the Old Man River Basin. Uh, in the north there, you see the city of Calgary, the Elbow Watershed. So we're doing a lot of work with, uh, with Calgary and really work along the entire East Slopes, trying to connect what's happening with our critical source waters uh, and what that means for people downstream. What has what distinguishes this, this work really from most other research is it's a very large interdisciplinary group of researchers, so we're really looking at connecting what's happening with headwaters hydrology, ecology, uh, water quality, how, what does that look like at larger basin scales downstream, what does that then mean for people and communities. Uh, the focus here is on drinking water and then tying that into the uh, economic uh, implications of all of that. And this is really what sets this, this team apart worldwide. This work has been described as probably the most comprehensive source to tap look at these kinds of issues worldwide. So what do we see? So really quickly here, um, very quickly we've got a group of bars. We're looking at uh, 12 years or 10 years or 11 years, sorry, of uh, water quality data from that fire. The green bars are reference unburned watersheds. Black is burned watersheds and, and orange is, is um, uh, salvage log watersheds and what you're looking at here are two things. I want you only to, to take away two messages from this piece. Top graph is looking at what happened to nitrogen. We had big effects on nitrogen and stream water afterwards but it recovered comparatively quickly and by quickly I mean four or five years which is interesting because from some perspectives that's an agonizingly long period of time. The corollary is other water quality parameters haven't recovered at all after over a decade. Uh, sediment production, organics. Uh, phosphorus is a, good, is a good example of that. Phosphorus is stored and transported in close association with, uh, with sediment, and so we see no recovery after a decade. That's had ecological effects. So these are very nutrient-poor systems. You put a little bit of nutrients, phosphorus is the, the limiting nutrient, into the water, all of a sudden the streams have become choked with algae and plants. Those plants in turn become food for insects, macroinvertebrates, and here you're looking at a graph of um, invertebrate densities. We've seen an increase in, in the populations and the diversity of those communities after that wildfire. And again, that's food then for other trophic levels, fish in this case. So we've seen an increase in, in growth rate of those fish. So this is an example of a very simple food chain that you learned about in elementary school driven by um, bottom-up effects. Wildfire affects sediment that's bound to phosphorus. Phosphorus drives uh, changes in plant production and then a number of rungs on the trophic ladder. And so we see these kinds of ecological effects and they have persisted for over a decade in this particular system. And that's, compl that's very different than what we see elsewhere in North America or worldwide. And there's reasons for that. Um, on, the, on the more human side, these these water quality parameters also affect human use of water. Here's some examples of two water quality parameters that are key for drinking water treatment and treatability, uh, sediment turbidity and um, dissolved organic carbon or, or organics. And again, what you've seen is no change in um, the elevated uh, effects of that after wildfire in over a decade. And so uh, the last four, five, six days have been exceedingly busy. This team has been engaged very much uh, with Fort McMurray, what's going on with emergency planning for Fort McMurray. Uh, and so uh, very much thinking about uh, what are going to be the, the effects, potential effects of that fire on water resources immediately there and operation of critical infrastructure. What you see there is the uh, region of, uh, uh, regional municipality of Wood Buffalo Water Treatment Plant uh, at the southern end of Fort McMurray. And so we're, we've been working very closely with, uh, with provincial authorities on trying to move forward um, in, in emergency um, characterization of those effects moving forward to, uh, to um, uh, over the next days, months, weeks, uh, and potentially years in terms of people moving back to Fort McMurray. Um, I'll end. If this, I'll end with this project, really, first phase of this project, very much focused on climate, natural disturbance, wildfire. In this particular case, the second phase of this project really started last year, looking at a parallel suite of issues around how is it that we manage these source waters. The particular focus here is on forestry practices and alternative um, harvesting practices, and how does that, uh, what are the implications of that to the same broad suite of linkages from, from source waters all the way to 
to downstream and um, implications for society. Uh, and with that, I'm going to wrap up with, uh, I've been kind of the front man up here. This is the work of a very large integrated team. I need to acknowledge the other researchers that have been a part of this. We have a very large team of about 11 researchers, uh, large staff. Uh, my uh, uh, Monica Melko and myself co-lead this pro project. Uh, and so this is a pan-Canadian, lots of Canadian universities uh, and universities in America. Uh, and, and in Great Britain. And then lastly, I'd like to acknowledge a, a large group of partners that have supported this work over the past 13 years. And so with that, I'd be, uh, I'd be happy to answer any question I possibly can. Normally what we do is that uh, I get to ask one question, because I, ha I have a mic that works now. Um, so I think you said the situation that you've seen in southern Alberta is different from other areas of North America. So why, why how and why? Ah, that's, a, that's an excellent question, Jay. Um, there's a number of reasons. Part of it has to do with the, the condition of the forest. A lot of it has to do with the climate. Climate up here is a little bit different than other parts of the world, of course. Uh, and then some of it has to do with the geology. Uh, and so what we've seen is, as an example, in many of these uh, American jurisdictions, they have large water quality effects, uh, catastrophic emergency sediment debris flows. But after about two or three years, those effects are largely gone. Um, that's the same in Australia where we've seen um, uh, large occurrences of wildfire. In Alberta, um, we've got largely a sedimentary geology. And moreover, we've had four major glaciations over the last 100,000 years. And so what that's meant is our soils and our sufficient geology tends to be really fine-grained, which means we don't see some of those catastrophic sediment events. Mm. But the corollary is those fine-grained sediments are the primary vectors for storage and transport of many of the contaminants that we're concerned about. And it's that reason that we see some of these water quality effects that have lasted beyond a decade. We've still seen no recovery in some of these. Great. Thanks very much, Aldous. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Because Flavio will be coming up. I said at the beginning that um, it's striking how international the research is in this province. Uh, and when it comes to food production, uh, ev I think food producers anywhere, ev everywhere, have to be aware of what uh, we're facing over the next 30 to 35 years. You know, in 2050, world population is projected to be 2 billion more people than there are now, 9.5. There have been estimates that uh, globally we might have to produce 50 to 75 percent more food than we're actually producing today. One estimate said over the next 50 years, we're going to have to produce as much food as was produced from the dawn of history until now. These are mind-boggling numbers. Uh, and, you know, we can also say, well, since the 1950 and the Green Revolution, we've increased grain production 50 percent, but only used 9 percent more land. On the other hand, pesticides, water use, fossil fuel use, all of these played an important role in the Green Revolution and may not be able to be continued. In this province, when it comes to grain, you know, I think that we're quite familiar with uh, wheat, canola. Barley's also a big crop, although I would argue that barley's not quite as uh, familiar to, to most. But we have a really powerful global center for barley research in this province. It's called the, uh, uh, sorry, what is it called? Yes, the uh, Field Crop Development Center. It's in Lacombe. Flavio Capitini is head of research and a barley breeder at that institution. Please welcome him now. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, incredible meeting. Uh, I, they are setting up my presentation. I think it was a, a glitch there, but um, I'd like to talk. Hello. Yeah, now the microphone is working. Okay, yes, I, after I was invited to this presentation, I didn't realize the challenge of summarizing 12,000 years in 10 minutes. 
<laughs> so I'll try to talk a little bit fast here, but uh, this is uh, my business about producing, helping producing food. And the plant breeding startup is much with agriculture. That's why I, uh, 12, 12 14,000 years ago, when the first growers started to select seeds to have a better crop in the next generation. And uh, like uh, Jay already introduced that, we have two more billion people to feed uh, by 2050, and uh, we have to produce uh, enough food for them. So uh, I'd like to quote one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Norman Bollock, is the Greenpeace, uh, Green uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel Peace Prize of 1972, and he says, you can't build a peaceful world on empty stomachs and human misery. And that's so you, when you see the price of food going up, you can see those uprisings, and probably the Arab Spring uh, had, was related with the high price of food on 2011. So that's how important it is to have enough food. And I'd like to take the case of example of barley. That uh, just happened to be the crop I know the most. And uh, this is the fifth most grown crop in the world and among the most cosmopolitan of the crops. They are grown from the equator to Alaska and uh, it's highly resilient. It's usually the last crop you can see before you get into the desert. So it's a very important crop. And it uh, has so many uses from annual feed, human food, malt for whiskey and beer, and bioproducts like uh, uh, value uh, some microfibers and other uses, industrial uses. And you can see barley at around 5,000 meters above sea level. Here we are at 3,500, but see these patches in the top of the Andes, you are around 5,000 meters, so it's among the last crops that grow at that altitude. And like many other crops here in Canada, they haven't, they haven't originated here, it comes from the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East. And uh, that's, uh, so that has been uh, deployed all around the world and improved in different areas. It has to be adapted to different countries. And it is also known to be one of the main foods of the gladiators. And they gave it the stamina, the energy, and uh, the good health that they had to go. And some people, uh, we can see that Bali also gives some better flavor to the meat, and maybe the lions were appreciating that also. <laughs> so there are so many types of barley. They have two, six row, mostly used for malt, and six row, most, mostly for feed and forage. You have barleys that are uh, hullless or naked and covered, you have barleys that have special uses for forage. So, and that's a part of the introduction. I like to also was asked to give some history, my history, my background and how I came to Canada. I would like to say that I, I was born in a little town in southern Brazil that's uh, most, mostly, mostly German immigrants. And you can see that was a place where in Brazil they make the Oktoberfest. It's like a little Germany, and I think that probably has shaped a little bit my career for the future. <laughs> see, they have a big meat producers. You can see huge barbecues they make there, and that also probably influenced the passion I have for my profession. Then when I was 15 years old, my mother is from Uruguay. I moved to Uruguay and I did my bachelor in agronomy there. Then I started working right away in the oldest uh, agricultural experiment station in the Latin America, is the Las Tanzuela, and I was right away uh, given the responsibility of barley breeding. And then I, I was been working that since then. And then after four years of working in Uruguay, releasing a few varieties, I had to go to the University of Minnesota, do my master's and PhD, and then right after that, I started working for the international research centers. I was based in Mexico first, and then I moved to Syria later. <clears throat> There's a network of international centers that do agricultural research. That's where the Green Revolution started. And uh, one of my main mentors was, uh, I mentioned, Nobel Peace Prize, Norman Bolo. This is my advisor, Don Rasmussen. And then I was able to release some varieties that you're probably trying in the, when you try the Mexican beers now. They are really popular in Mexico. And then I moved to Syria, to Jordan, and then I finished in, three years ago in <laughs> Canada. <laughs> so I have to be, I think I kind of inherited that resilience, you know. 
but th that's not the point. I have been able to that in those traveling all around those countries and see how passionate researchers are about breeding. And I have seen my colleagues in Tunisia, Mozambique, Ethiopia, see all are proud of their, produce, their products, Algeria, India, in China, Ecuador, Morocco, and Peru. And then I came to the Field Crop Development Center, a great team of researchers that are really doing a great job for Canada in the world. And the mission is to develop enhanced cereal crops for feed, malt, food, and bioindustrial uses. It's incredible. And then I always like to say everything starts here. This summer, when the Canadian people have will be exercising their passion of uh, having a barbecue, drinking a beer, or eating some bread, have to see that all of that has to start with a good variety. So, also so many products we are not aware that are branded like a Parma prosciutto, the Parmesan cheese, or a good marbled like Wagyu beef or, or Kobe. Those are thanks, thanks, possible thanks to barley, barley that gives that distinctive quality to those products. And you see also it's political related. Beer is the most popular of, of the drinks. You know it's always related, can have even political implications as you can see that. Obama makes beer in the White House. And uh, the perspective is that's going to continue. So that's good for us. So I think that's a good thing. So we have a conventional program, you know. We start by crossing. That's our main program. We have to build genes that give that yield and quality. And that also we have a biotech lab that we can see the genes or try to see the genes and to accumulate those better genes. That's genetics. And for that, we have uh, 50, 60,000 plots every year that you have to select. And if you're lucky, one variety is going to go out there from there every, each year. So that's uh, basically our job. And the center has been very successful. It has been almost more than one variety per year. And we work there with wheat, triticale, and all kinds of barley, as I mentioned. So the objective is we have to get better yields, better agronomic types, so the growers are able to grow it, enhance quality, and resistance to economy, protect that with better disease resistance and make it sustainable. We work also for better use of fertilizers with nitrogen use efficiency, better use of water. So those are the kinds of diseases we can see. Now, the, the, the last one that's striking here is the Fusarium head blight. So there are many diseases that you have to protect and find genetic resistance for that. And international collaboration. That's our one sample of the places we are continuously exchanging seeds knowledge and uh, trying to use that to improve. So it's a vast uh, network of researchers that help us to do our job better. And then we protect all what we get in the gene banks. This is an example, the vault in the Svalbard, is uh, where we, they're keeping all, most of the seed of this world in case of apocalypse comes, at least it will be saved in there. It's in northern, it's an island in northern Europe. And this is our job. We have to increase yields. I say here in 1962, you can see that the Canada has done a very good job in increasing yields. It started from a little bit above one ton per hectare in 62, and now we are close to four tons per hectare in average. So it has been increasing at a higher rate than, than the world. And that's what our job is, has to be, to produce more and better food. And it, that's the world in Canada, but here is our program. We have to continually assess what our program is doing. And see all the varieties released since 1982, you can see that there has been a tremendous increase. In, the, in this case, we say it's 50% due to genetics and 50% due to agronomy. And in here is basically only this example is genetics. You only can see that the, the different types of crops, we have here the whole or naked, the uh, two row and the six rows, but all of being around 2% of increase every year. If we keep doing that rate of increase, we will be able to, uh, to keep feeding the world in the near future. Canada is the fourth highest producing barley country in the world. 
and is also here is where the ballet is growing in Western Canada. You can see Alberta grows 50% of the ballet of whole Canada. And even in those high latitudes, you can see from the border to the high latitudes, you can find ballet. And now the next challenge, as you see, we have in our building program, we have always uh, having challenges. And this is the craft brewing industry is increasing very much, but it's also a big opportunity because it uses more than 50% more ballet than the regular beer. So that's uh, some of the examples of the challenge we have in the near future. We are very happy to have that. And for that, we need a very specialized team, well-trained, committed, and passionate about the work. So we have been, that's why we have been able to have those, all those good results. The Field Crop Development Center in Lacombe is really, really. And, but we don't work, see, alone. But see, the conclusion is the crop improvement is a continuous and a cumulative process. You don't see that many things you do now, we are going to see 10, 20 years from now. So it has to be accumulative. It's a, needed a big national, international collaboration. We collaborate with the other programs in Canada, in Brandon, in Saskatchewan. Several disciplines interact in a coordinated way. They have to have biotechnology, pathology, biology, agronomy, everything. And we are making progress, but more needs to be done. It has to be really, it's very important to keep investing in research. And fortunately, you have a good group of stakeholders and, and people that believe in us, especially Alberta Innovates Biosolutions. They have been a big believer, and we really appreciate all the support and the brainstorming sessions we have with Cornelia, with Virginia, with Guinea, and others here. So is that bad? We are being able to keep doing our work in that way. And thank you, and sorry if I, the 12,000 years went too fast. So, um, Flavio, Oldis mentioned uh, impacts on wildfire from apparent climate change over the last few decades. And you said that barley is, is a crop that can grow in fairly marginal areas. And your map showed it can go right up to the top. So do you anticipate that if uh, climate continues to warm, that barley production will be able to spread significantly northward? Uh, well, I said the barley is, uh, is the, the crop for climate change. It can, you know, really get adapted, can be bred for especially non, very suboptimal regions. And I think that uh, we have to, uh, we have that work to select the best varieties to those environments. I think Bali is the crop that has a higher probability of, of getting adapted to, to low, you know, drought, uh, uh, heat tolerance, salinity, all, all other kinds of limitations. Thanks again. Love it. Thank you. Thava is, uh, yeah, OK. Um, so that's a pretty good picture of, uh, I think, of where Alberta stands in the, in the in encouraging new strains and better techniques for producing larger crops of barley. But uh, if you're talking about innovation, there's always another step beyond the actual production of the, of the agricultural product, and that is to turn it into a variety of food products or, indeed, other products that aren't necessarily food. And uh, we're going to get a peek at what can be done with barley right now. Thava Vasanthan is Professor of Grain Processing Science and Technology at Ailes at the University of Alberta. Thava. Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk something different uh, from production. This is mainly into processing of barley. Thanks, Flavio, to set the stage for me in terms of the importance of barley. And barley we produce here uh, in Alberta quite a lot. Before that, I just want to uh, indicate where I come from here. Uh, I come from a country called Sri Lanka. It's in an Asian country. It's a small little island and surrounded by sandy beaches, always 30 degrees. I mean, plus 30 degrees. Um, so it's quite a cultural and uh, environmental shock for me when I came here. Uh, I did my basic agriculture degree there. 
and uh, specialized on grain processing. We grew a lot of paddy or rice in Sri Lanka. <clears throat> and then I went into a, in, on a scholarship to England and uh, finished my food technology because I my interest uh, was based on food and processing. So I specialized in food technology and then came to Canada. That's minus 30. And uh, coming into food science, uh, specialization. That's where I gained quite a lot of uh, experience in uh, grains and processing and the importance to the world, you see. So can Canada produces quite a lot of barley. This is one of the barley fields I visited and we produce nearly 10 million metric tons of barley. Uh, but we feed them to animals and most of the nearly 75, 80% of the barley produced in Canada fed to animals and then we uh, use it for malting and brewing and some into food. But when you indicate, uh, when I indicate barley, what does that remind us of is uh, uh, some pot barley and pearl barley, Campbell's soups, and uh, the famous beef barley soup, you see. Of course, we don't want to forget this beer that comes from barley as well. But if you look at, uh, there is more potential to barley than just bread and beer, in my view. Uh, there are quite a lot of uh, lucrative components uh, that are embedded into that barley matrix that we can take advantage of. So one of the components uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you today is uh, about beta-glucan. I call it as a gold in barley grains. So it's a hidden treasure, in fact. And uh, beta-glucan is present in the, in the cell walls, or in other words, beta-glucan forms the cell walls of barley grains. And you can see if you take a kernel of barley grain and cut across and see the surface or the cut surface, and if you expand it using scanning electron microscope, and this is what you expect to see. So you have uh, quite a lot of round stuff there. This is the starch that you see there. And the beta-glucan is present uh, on the cell walls. You can see the clear definition of cell walls there. So beta-glucan forms the cell wall. And it has quite a lot of health benefits. It has been known for years. But the challenge is how to take this molecule successfully to the consumer's mouth in order to achieve these health benefits. It has cholesterol reduction potential, and also it helps in the management of diabetes. And also gut health and uh, weight control, also good applications for beta-glucan. Just want to highlight briefly how it works. When you consume beta-glucan containing products like barley or oat as well, and uh, its molecular structure is like threads, you see? Just imagine uh, like threads here, it forms a network of structure. And this is the network that is responsible for the health benefits of beta-glucan. And it forms the networks and it traps bile acids, which is, uh, which is produced from cholesterol pulled from the blood. So if you excrete bile acid in a regular basis by consuming this beta-glucan in a regular basis, then you expect to see reduction in the blood cholesterol level. And this has been done, or it has been proven through many clinical trials, and uh, there are approved health claims available these days. And also, the, uh, if I talk about the sugar absorption, I mean starch uh, management, I and mean starch consumption, and how to manage the consumption is the big issue to all ages. And beta-glucan helps in the slow digestion of starch and slow release of glucose into the bloodstream so that you can manage this diabetes disease which is growing in the society in an alarming rate. So these are the major health issues, cardiovascular diseases, ob obesity, and 33% more people are obese in Canada. And uh, if you look at the uh, death uh, uh, percentage, and 27% of the total death in 2004 is uh, through cardiovascular diseases. And diabetes aggravates that, you see. Although the, the direct uh, death is only 3% reported in WHO, but 
uh, actually diabetes influences uh, cardiovascular uh, system and, uh, and leads to cardiovascular deaths. So this is an opportunity. You have a good grain here with a, with a component that we understood clearly that it benefits health. And on the other hand, the health problems are growing across the world. So I see this as a big opportunity and uh, uh, barley beta glucan uh, really can help to alleviate global health issues. And the food and supplement industries are continually searching for uh, healthy ingredients to change their formulation or to improve their formulation. Health Canada and FDA and European Food Safety Authority, they have evaluated all the clinical trials that have been done with respect to beta-glucan from oats and barley. And they have clearly done a good analysis and, and approved health claims for beta-glucan. So this is another big opportunity for the industries. First thing, it, in, it informs the consumers very well, because it's a government-approved health claim. And the second thing is industries can print labels on their packages in order to inform the consumers as well as to gain demand for the product. So, but the daily requirement is three grams. You have to uh, consume three grams of beta-glucan, net beta-glucan, in order to uh, gain that health benefit. So one gram of beta-glucan per serving for three servings recommended. So can I drink beer to get the health benefits of barley beta-glucan? Unfortunately, no, because uh, uh, when you process beer, I mean, you're basically using certain enzymes and natural enzymes that kill the beta-glucan. So beta-glucan is not uh, present in the final product. So how about cereal products, like beta-glucan-containing cereal products? you need three to four bowls or for three to four servings in a daily basis. So you can consume, definitely. Uh, you have seen these uh, package printings, cholesterol uh, reduction, again, for barley products, cholesterol reduction. But these products have very low concentration of beta-glucan. So in order to consume three grams per day in a daily basis, you have to consume three to four bowls per day of oat porridge or any um, beta-glucan-containing product, which is not pragmatic. You can't uh, motivate the consumers to, to consume this product in a daily basis. So concentrated beta-glucan is a choice. You can concentrate the beta-glucan from barley, and then you can add it into a variety of food products so that you are providing a wider choice to the consumers. So you can try different products in a daily basis in order to satisfy the physiologically active dosage. So these are some of the companies producing beta-glucan concentrates across the world. And uh, um, the price point is very high. That's the major problem. Now, food industries cannot afford it. Supplement companies, they are affording it currently. But the food industries, in order for them to afford, it should be less than $10 per kilogram. Uh, because looking at the, the consumption rate of three grams per uh, day. So you need cost-efficient technologies. That's where we came in. And we identified this in my research program, and we connected with the funding agencies, Alberta Bio Solutions, and variety of Alberta Bali and other funding agencies. Uh, we had a good discussion about how to take this molecule to the consumer's mouth in an affordable manner. <clears throat> so we developed two technologies in, our, uh, in, our, in my lab. And uh, the first technology is an aqueous alcohol type of technology and we created a, a company or founded a company in 2002. And the second technology is more of a dry technology. Uh, I will briefly discuss that next. Uh, and we founded a company called Grain Frack Inc. that is currently in progress. So you can see the barley flour here. Uh, the cell walls are here where the beta glucan is. So what we have done here is we scooped off all the cell contents so this technology has been developed uh, uh, by variety of understanding in terms of how solvents work 
with the Bali matrix and how different enzymes work in a particular solvent to clean up these components. So basically you can see here the cell walls are left behind intact. So the native beta-glucan and its properties are well preserved. So we developed this technology in 2002, I believe, and uh, we, uh, we patented this technology. And it is a 60% concentration from 6 to 60, 10 times more. And it provided some flexibility for the formulators. But we couldn't bring the price below $25 per kilogram. You see, it's still high for uh, the food industries to afford. So I continued my effort in terms of developing technologies, thanks to Alberta Biosolutions Bio for, for their continued trust in my program, research program. And uh, we developed another technology. It is, uh, uh, it is basically using air currents. You, you supply the air currents in different direction and create a tornado like an effect so that you separate the fibers at one point uh, from the matrices. And we developed the product, and it is we were very, we were able to come down uh, the, to the price point around seven to ten dollars. Now we are selling it at that point, and we named it as Sera Beta. It is a serial beta glucan, so we put it as a Sera Beta. And according uh, up to our knowledge, to our knowledge, this is the most affordable serial beta glucan concentrate in the world. We are trying to approach uh, across the globe to market this product right now. And this is our pilot plant facility, which we are con uh, continue to work on to expand the facility, as well as uh, to, uh, to uh, improve the quality of the product. So basically, this is a grain storage, and we clean the grain. We mill it in a specific way to reduce the particle size of the grain, and then we supply it to uh, the ACAPS, we call it. It's called Air Current Assisted Particle Separation Technology. So this is our invention, and you see uh, the setup here, and then we package the product, and uh, we sell it in bulk and retail. So if you look at here, the, the effort that we uh, made is mainly to take this molecule uh, in an affordable way to the consumer's mouth. So I think uh, with that, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. So you've actually made great strides in uh, increasing the percentage of beta-glucan. Do you want to, where do you want to go from, besides the pilot plant, in terms of research, where do you want to go? So the, the barley grain, uh, when we take it and we are harvesting only uh, twenty percent of the material as fiber concentrate, so the remaining eighty percent we still have to deal with, and a lot of starch and protein and other valuable components. So we are focusing on two different areas: how to take this beta glucan into different cultures. I mean, when I take it to Canadian culture versus a culture in Japan, altogether food systems are different. So when you put this beta-glucan into those food matrices, how they behave, whether they degrade or whether they still remain as a whole native molecule, that we are studying on. And also, we are looking at how to improve value for our byproduct. We have to drive the business with this main product, 20% or uh, 30 percent beta glucan, but whatever we get value from the byproduct could be the profit. So we are focusing research on both angles. Great. Uh, we have time uh, for some questions from you, the audience, before we take a break. So if I could ask the first two speakers to uh, come back up, and then I understand there are people with microphones, uh, and we'd really there they are. They emerged as if. By magic. Uh, so we'd really appreciate it if you could put up your hand. Uh, we will bring a microphone to you because we're videotaping this and we want to be able to hear the question. Jay, there's one here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, some barley questions. In the with the beta glucan. Uh, Flavio mentioned that there are 43 different seed types now. 
is that beta glucan vary by uh, seed type? And, and following on from that, are microbiomes uh, vary geographically? If you're exporting these beta glucans from Alberta, let's say, to Japan, as you mentioned, any impact? And then the second question is, uh, we're up to four, uh, four tons per hectare, I believe you said. Uh, by the way, I appreciate your uh, passion for Shahasko and Savasia. Um, have Is anybody looking at uh, aeroponics and verticals for uh, increasing yield growing barley? I start here. Yeah. What, what was the last, looking for what to increase in barley, sorry? Are you or is anybody else uh, looking at aeroponics or vertical hydroponics for growing barley? Uh, let's see, yeah, there is a genetic variability for beta-glucan content. Maybe Tava can talk more about that, but there are varieties that have the variation will be from 4% up to 12%. Of course, that has to be also the challenge is to find the varieties that have that content and yield that much also. Uh, that's the average of three, four tons per hectare, uh, very linked to environment. We have potential, potential in up to 10 or 12 tons per hectare here in Alberta. So that was an average. Uh, the short question is no yet about hydroponics. I've seen some countries that have been working hydroponics and hydroponics mostly for forage barley or for feeding barley, germinated barley to animals. I haven't seen that, maybe I'm not aware enough of that going on, but that can be, if there is interest, we can research on that also. As, uh, can Flav you get, oh, you've got a mic, right? Uh, as Flavio mentioned, the, the beta-glucan content of barley seed ranges from 3% to, uh, say, 12% or 16% in one of the particular specific variety. But when you choose a variety, uh, definitely our business is focused on beta-glucan, so we need a highest beta-glucan content. But we also looked into the matrix properties, you know, different barleys behave differently during processing. You may have the highest beta-glucan content. We had one variety, but when you start a process, it didn't work in our, uh, in our process, you see. So we had to evaluate many different varieties ranging in beta-glucan content to choose the best variety. Uh, for our operation. But the question is an uh, interesting question that the beta-glucan content is, uh, is very important and there are a lot of breeding programs uh, at Lacombe as well as in Saskatchewan. They are developing varieties and definitely uh, these are quite advantage uh, for us. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, more barley questions. Um, First question is to Flavio, I guess. Your slides talked about bioproducts. And outside of beta-glucan, do you see other types of products, whether food or industrial, uh, based on the varieties you're working with that have some future potential? Oh, sure, yes. Yeah, you have uh, many products that can be developed. Of course, the, the main can be for, um, there is all the, depending on the final use you target your breeding will be the, the trace that you're looking for. So in the case of animal feed, you'll have the energy content, the energy digestibility. In the case of uh, forage, you have to see the fiber digestibility for human consumption. For malt, you have those traits that make the best beer, including uh, components, protein, uh, starch, and flavor. And uh, there is a, a big department also in the university, I can say, about talking about different products that can be developed from nanotechnology, protein, and many, uh, many products that are working to develop uh, from, from that badly. So on top of, uh, just to add a mm -hmm. more point to you, uh, in, in Bali there are regular type and vaxi type and high amylose type, these are some technical terms. Uh, the high amylose type of varieties uh, are getting popular, especially in the corn industry. If you take the corn industry, they have this high maize. 
high maize is a high amylose containing corn uh, that is very popular in industrial processing because this amylose, uh, when you incorporate that into food products and when you dry the final food product, it gains resistance for intestinal digestion. So basically you can consume starch that has a resistance so it is digested in a slower manner and the sugar is released into your blood is a, in a very slower manner. This is a big advantage to the regular population as well as to, for the people, for people who are suffering uh, with diabetes. On top of the other side, the waxy starch I called, and it is a very low amylose, and it has unique properties for food applications in order to create different uh, or unique textures in the food products. So Bali has advantage. Research is still going on in terms of varietal development on both sides, waxy as well as high amylose side. Can I add a yeah. comment? Yeah, Please. that's very cultural. You know, uh, here in the. In the developed countries, Bali has lost a lot of ground, I think, compared to other more processed foods. But, if, for example, in Tibet, in Northern Africa, see that picture I saw of my friend, uh, Mohamed Matugi, buying, that was Bali bread in Morocco. But all North Africa, Tibet, is uh, West, West China, uh, all the Andean regions, there, you, have, you go to Peru and Ecuador, you have big shelves in supermarkets all with Bali products. And uh, there are all kinds of characteristics, including if you go, the, besides the ones that Tava, uh, now we are also talking about the antioxidants in color barley. There are different colors of barley, purple, anthocyanin free, uh, uh, rich, and that also antioxidants and vitamin E and everything. Not to mention beer. Uh, uh, question here. Oh, uh, question on... Um fire and water. So Aldous, your second last slide, you made a connection with the research that you did in southwestern Alberta with a recent fire up in Fort McMurray and, and made a connection to the water treatment plant. So I want to ask something about the forest land base. Uh, you showed significant impacts of phosphorus, organics, uh, long-term impacts both of fire on the water quality in southwestern Alberta but an even increased impact of salvage logging in that system on those same parameters. And so we just had a big fire in northeastern Alberta. It's the second one in the last uh, five years. Can you make a comment on uh, salvage logging issues uh, post-fire and the potential impacts on the Athabasca, the Clearwater, um, recognizing that it's already an uh, impacted river from natural and, uh, and industrial impacts in the area? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, our work can you on step, the... Can you move to the mic? Hold oh, sorry. <clears throat> our work on the uh, Lost Creek wildfire there, the... Uh, <clears throat> The salvage logging there, I mean, first of all, if we back it up, the idea behind salvage logging is to capture some of the, the timber value uh, from, from burnt landscapes. And the decision is really a difficult one, I think, for, uh, for governments to make because what you're doing is introducing another disturbance on top of a landscape that's already disturbed. And so from that perspective, um, it was no surprise to us to see that salvage logging had a had a fairly strong incremental effect on some of the water quality parameters that we were focused on, some of the, the ecological values as well. Um, one disturbance layered over top of another. Um, I'm unaware of, um, at this stage, uh, I don't think anybody is starting to think about salvage logging yet um, with respect to the, the Fort McMurray fire. Certainly that's probably something that will come up in the coming months. Um, but our work to the extent that the work we've done in the Front Range Rockies in the southwest uh, part of the province, um, it's, it's probably um, a reasonable indication that where you do have already a, dis a severely disturbed landscape, and certainly Fort McMurray and Lost Creek were both severe, severe burns, you've got one disturbance on top of another, so it's, it's reasonable to expect uh, an incremental impact on some of those water quality parameters. The interesting aside more recently is um, longer term, because we've been studying these, these, uh, these trends for over a decade, what we've seen, um, this work has not been published yet, uh, is we're seeing um, fairly rapid drop in nitrogen levels after salvage logging in southwest Alberta down below baseline levels. And so what's happening is you have all these nutrients left over and, and, and the next 
the next forest as it's growing is making use of those nutrients. And so what we're seeing in those salvage log watersheds is our nutrient, <coughs> our nitrogen levels are going now well below uh, baseline undisturbed levels. So, uh, and that's basically because that growing forest is now sucking up all of that nitrogen. It's the key limiting nutrient for, for tree growth. So there's all kinds of interesting dynamics that are taking place over longer periods of time that we really didn't think about at the beginning when we started to look at this. And so we're now thinking about, well, what does this look like two or three decades out? And in fact, uh, it, it ties into our concept of landscape watershed recovery after disturbance. These forested landscapes are not static. There's disturbances on the landscape, historic and, and more, more contemporary. And so the forest is at various stages of growth. Uh, and so, so this idea that we have disturbance and then things return to an undisturbed state uh, is something that we're really starting to rethink, this, this notion of watershed recovery. The systems are very dynamic, but the time steps are uh, decades, centuries, and it's, it's, a, it's a time scale that human beings aren't comfortable thinking about. I don't know if that answers your question. But it's a good answer anyway. <laughs> and that's the most important thing. Uh, yes. Hi, um, another fire question. Can you comment on the hypothesis that uh, the increased suppression of smaller fires is a direct contributor to the increased incidence of larger fires? Um, so I'll preface anything I say with, uh, <laughs> with uh, everyone's understanding that I'm not a fire expert. Uh, uh, I'm a forest hydrologist. I, I, I spent a lot of time playing with uh, water treatment people, with fire experts, and certainly that, that has been a topic of much discussion and investigation in the literature. My sense of the scientific consensus is that increasingly over time we're coming to recognize that in fact human intervention in the state and condition of those forests is having an additional effect on, on that fire regime. So. Um, Suppression is one of those. How we manage those forests is another, but suppression is certainly one of those. So as we're suppressing these fires, it means there's more fuel available for a potential fire in the next decade or the decade beyond. And so I, I think the answer to the question in terms of scientific consensus is increasingly the belief is that that's exactly what we're seeing. The demonstrable evidentiary basis for that conclusion is a, is a difficult one to to conclusively show. And I think we have time for one more here. Can you wait for the mic? It's coming. Thank you. Thanks. This is a barley question. Um, have you folks seen any interest or any value in the fiber content of the barley stalk, the stem or the plant? Any value in that at all? Obviously, that's a substantial volume of the end product. Yeah. The fiber content of barley uh, biomass, I think that's what you meant. Yeah, um, definitely beta-glucan is not there. No, I'm uh, thinking so, more from a fibrous uh, point of view. There are beta-glucan of different kind. It's called cellulose. There are lots of cellulose. It is a kind of beta-glucan as well. But the properties of cellulose is totally different from the beta-glucan I discussed here. But the cellulose biomass utilization is moving in a very... Uh, advanced direction in terms of producing the second generation uh, biofuels uh, as well as converting them into uh, into variety of industrial products. I say more from the fiber point of view though. Yes. Okay, there is movement in that direction. Yes. Thanks. Thank you all. Uh, we have uh, until 1030. We have to be back here sharp at 1030 to keep this ship moving forward at the right speed, but please join me in giving our first three speakers a hand. <laughs>